It seems like only yesterday the Ouya was the hottest thing in the gaming world, raising over $8.6 million on Kickstarter. Yet tomorrow, June 25th, the Ouya is being put out to pasture. It's been a dead console walking for quite some time already, but Razer, who purchased the Big O brand in 2015, is finally putting a ring on it. They're pulling the plug on the online storefront, effectively making the digital download only console little more than a paperweight. The Ouya led a fascinatingly short life as one of the biggest flops in console gaming history, which is morbidly ironic considering it's also the highest funded video game project on Kickstarter, and the second most funded gaming crowdfunding project ever, next to Star Citizen. How did this little console that couldn't go from the toast of the town to a laughing stock so quickly? Was it doomed to fail from the start? And whatever happened to its creators? Let's find that out together, shall we? The Ouya debuted on July 10th, 2012, the same day the Cookie Monster released his Billboard Hot 100 topping single, Share It Maybe. In a bold move, the Kickstarter campaign also doubled as the unveiling of both the console and the company behind it. It's pretty bold to just throw something up on the internet and hope people stumble across it. This risky marketing campaign, as well as the console itself, are the product of Boxer 8, a startup tech firm founded in 2011 by Julie Ehrman. Ehrman rose through the ranks of the tech industry fairly quickly, getting her start at good old Wedbush Securities in 1996 before landing a job as publishing manager at Vivendi Games in 2002, and later, Vice President of Business Development and Digital Distribution at IGN in 2009. Must have been a big business card. She left there in 2011 to start Boxer 8, with the goal of creating a developer-friendly gaming console. That's what I'm getting from the Kickstarter anyway. That's a pretty common sentiment these days, and it was back in 2012 when Kickstarter first took off for video games too. Everyone from Tim Schafer to Brian Fargo to Chris Roberts all hailed Kickstarter as the savior of gaming for taking publishers out of the equation and giving developers total control. All the big Kickstarter campaigns led with this back in the day, and for a while, this kind of talk alone was enough to get campaigns fully funded and then some. That's the model we saw with the Ouya's Kickstarter as well. The page opens with how big publishers are pushing away developers, causing them to leave the industry and ruin our games. The Ouya, it was said, would put the power in the developers' hands, as well as the gamers. Innovation, creativity, experimentation, games being less expensive to make and less expensive to buy. All these buzzwords and phrases litter the Kickstarter out a page like bugs in a Bethesda game. Boxer 8 wasn't being humble here, they were promising to change gaming forever with the Ouya. It's been seven years, but I can see something like this going over well today. Take away power from the corporate publishers, give it back to the developers to let them make games however they want, whenever they want, and let gamers play those wonderful games for little to no cost. The people's console, all hail Sobek. Quite a lot of promises for what was essentially a mobile phone hooked up to a TV. Maybe that's a little unfair. Mobile gaming wasn't the hellscape it is today back then. Sure, there were plenty of games full of microtransactions and tiny and loot boxes, but there were just as many great games out there on mobile, and mobile gaming really was a place to find unique, exciting new games. Maybe playing those kind of games on a TV wasn't such a bad idea. Plus, the Ouya promised some exclusive new games too, that could better take advantage of large screen TVs and dedicated physical controls. So, okay, despite my mocking, you can kinda see something here if you put your mind in the right place. Up your ass. But there's more to the pitch than that. The whole thing boils down to three big promises. The first First is that everything on the online storefront would be free, or at least free to try. The Kickstarter says, We're handing the reins over to the developer with only one condition. At least some gameplay has to be free. We borrowed the free-to-play model from games like League of Legends, Team Fortress 2, Triple Town, and many others. Developers can offer a free demo with a full game upgrade, in-game items or powers, or ask you to subscribe. Again, free to play and in-game items might send your head spinning, but remember, this was 2012 and the system was designed for developers, not publishers. The free-to-play model hadn't been perverted yet by the likes of Activision Blizzard and EA, and loot boxes didn't exist at all yet. And yeah, sure, developers can, and sometimes are as we'll later see, be greedy assholes just as much as the boogeymen of the gaming industry. But those who were committed to working on the Ouya at the time, like Double Fine, In Exile, and Mo Yang, all had a proven track record. The second point is that the Ouya was 100% hackable. You could root the console and it wouldn't void your warranty, I'm pretending like I know what that means, you could create your own peripherals, you could load emulators on it, which were available for free in the online store at one point, and you could even feed it after midnight. And that's all that needs to be said about this aspect of it, because as far as I'm aware, nobody ever bothered so much as loosening a single screw on the thing, much less marcusing it. 
We're going to skip ahead for the third big promise, which came a year after the Kickstarter campaign closed. In July 2013, the rebranded Ouya Inc. announced the Free the Games Fund, and just like that, I probably triggered any indie developers watching this. We'll get to how this ended later, but the premise was that Ouya would donate to Kickstarter-funded games the same amount that said campaign raised. So if, say, Clive and Wrench here met its $32,485 goal, Ouya would give developer Dinosaur Bites another $32,485 dollars on top of that, or however much it raised. That would double their budget to approximately $3,448,532,485. This was on two conditions. It would have to be Ouya exclusive, obviously, for six months, and they would only match funds between $50,000 and $250,000, working from a $1 million pot. Were those enough numbers for you? Good, because now we're going to talk specs. The Ouya came with an NVIDIA Tegra 3 quad-core CPU, 1 gig of RAM, 8 gigs of internal storage, it ran Android Jelly Bean, aka 4.1, had an HDMI port, a single USB slot, and a pencil sharpener. The thing about technology is that it kinda gets outdated rather quickly, and that was the case with the Ouya. By the time it finally came out in June 2013, NVIDIA had already released the Tegra 4, better than the 3 in just about every category. This is a bit of a problem on its own, but no big deal. That's just the nature of consoles. But it's the way Ouya handled this that crippled them from the start. Ehrman announced as early as October 2013, four months after release, that they were going to launch a new upgraded Ouya the following year. It wouldn't come with a Tigra 4, but it would have more internal storage, better Wi-Fi capabilities, and come with an improved controller. Now, the sharper viewers amongst you may be wondering by now, what's the point of the pencil sharpener? I'm already pretty damn sharp. The wisdom of announcing an upgrade so soon after releasing the original console is questionable to say the least, but look at it from their side. Reviews for the Ouya on its release were poor, with critics lamenting the lackluster library, terrible controller, lack of storage, Wi-Fi issues, and the UI. Well, Ouya was addressing all of these complaints. They announced the Free the Games Fund the same month the console launched to bring in new, better games, they eventually updated the UI, and now they were announcing a new Ouya with more internal storage, a better controller, and Wi-Fi connectivity. I'm pretty sure let me double check this real quick, um... It, it takes a minute, that's all. <sighs> oh, come on, you piece of junk. Welcome. Right, there we go. You've got mail. Uh, uh-huh, yep. You can't download a new, better controller, or a Wi-Fi aerial, or a car. Goodbye. You could use cloud storage, but I don't think Ouya had the resources for that. Plus, again, this is 2013. It wasn't really fully there yet. Plus the Wi-Fi problems, so you couldn't use it anyway. Okay, our trip to the future is over. That was fun, wasn't it? Boy, are my arms tired, etc, etc. So, back to Kickstarter, and we can see Ehrman eventually raised $8,596,474. But that figure doesn't tell the whole story. Did you know the campaign raised $1 million, blowing past its $950,000 goal in just one hour? It was, for the time, the fastest campaign to earn a million buckaroos on Kickstarter, reaching the milestone in just 8 hours and 22 minutes. By the end of day 2, they had raised $3.7 million in the bank. That's pretty impressive, seeing as how the point of the campaign was only to gauge interest in the project. In May 2013, Ouya secured $15 million in funding from venture capital groups Kleiner Perkins and Mayfield Fund. A venture capital group is basically a bunch of wealthy investors who look for startup companies they believe could become profitable and invest in them early in exchange for either equity or an ownership stake in that company. Basically, it's selling your soul to the devil. In Ouya's case, it meant having to add Bing Gordon to the board. No, that's not a Microsoft search engine, it's the former CCO of Electronic Arts and partner at Kleiner Perkins. Nobody can really say how this affected the company going forward, but in the short term, it was good news. The money would partially go towards funding developers, but mostly to put more stock on store shelves. That was pretty much the last good bit of news for Ouya, if indeed that was even good news. At the same time of getting that cool 15 mil, a delay of three weeks was announced. This was to give them more time to create and ship more units across the US, Canada, and the UK. It would also theoretically give them more time to ship out Kickstarter and pre order units. Theoretically. In reality, units arrived on store shelves before backers got their hardware. This wasn't supposed to happen, as backers were promised their consoles first and a super special limited edition version to boot. Ehrman apologized and gave backers who hadn't yet received their Ouya... <sighs> 
$13.37 of credit in the Ouya store. Ignoring the questionable dankness of that figure, that's pretty small potatoes for screwing up with shipping. Some backers didn't get their Ouya until months later. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if some never got the thing in the first place. And then there was the Free the Games Fund. It turns out that doubling the cash amount a developer raises through crowdfunding without any conditions is a bad idea. We'll start with the most infamous example, that of Gridiron Thunder. This, what you're looking at right now, managed to raise $171,000 on Kickstarter in September 2013. If you're wondering how this raised that much, take a look at how many backers there were and you'll probably have your answer. 183 people pledged all that money. That's an average of over $934 per backer. For this, 71 of those backers never backed a campaign before this, and 16 backers, the most of any one city, were in San Francisco, the same city developer Mogo TXT are based in. The accusations were, obviously, that the developers were creating fake Kickstarter profiles to donate to themselves in order to get Ouya's money. And if that weren't enough, Mogo TXT then threatened a backer with a lawsuit when they pointed out that the company was being sued by the state of California. Head of Mogo TXT, Andrew Wan, said it was an oversight site for them failing to send their annual filing report. Another backer called the campaign shady only for Juan to say that they were the real shady ones for donating only $1 to post that comment. Great PR. By the way, Mogo TXT hasn't released a game since. Then there was Elementary My Dear Homes, a point-and-click adventure mystery game that was shut down by Kickstarter after similar allegations of fund inflation against creator Sam Chandola. What's interesting in this case is that Chandola claims he contacted Kickstarter himself with these allegations, asking the company to look into some suspicious accounts. He says he didn't hear back from Kickstarter again and that the whole project was suddenly suspended, which is Kickstarter's nice way of saying cancelled. He denied any wrongdoing but has since just kind of vanished. Next up, there was Dungeon the Eye of Draconis, one of the most video game names ever. It was funded to the tune of $54,067 in September 2013, right up until it wasn't. Two days before the end of the campaign, it had only raised, you guessed it, $4,067 of its $10,000 goal. Then, all of a sudden, five people donated $10,000 each. Whoa, what a coincidence. What kind of sorcery is this? Well, as developer William A. McDonald admitted, it was the Witch Father variety. My father gave me five checks to give to my most trustworthy of friends, he wrote in a Kickstarter update. The fifth check was given to John to pledge for my father. My father cannot pledge himself because he expected to pledge on Kickstarter with a check, and he also didn't want his debit card on the internet. Everyone wins with this scenario, the update continued. We are going to make an excellent video game series for $65,000. Ooya match funds come in three distributions. First, $12,500 at the end of the KS. Second, $25,000 when the game is released. And finally, $12,500 after six months of Ooya exclusivity. Thanks to Ooya funds, we will be able to afford marketing, have a booth at PAX, and finish all of Dungeon's feature complete. It's just one guy paying $50,000 to fund a game. What's the harm in that? Well, Timmy, Timothy, not every game developer, especially those needing support on Kickstarter, have daddies who can just throw five figures at them. Not to mention the fact they were obviously gaming the system. The original goal of the campaign was only $10,000, remember? Why did it have to be five times that? Because they wanted the extra money from Ouya, of course. Money that, because of the $1 million cap, would be taken away from other developers who rightfully earned it. At first, Ouya stuck with all these developers, defending their choice to double a crowdfunding project's earning, no questions asked. Because of this, many indie developers protested, especially those who received previous support from the company or had games on the Ouya. Sophie Holden, creator of Rose and Time, pulled her game from the Ouya store, saying, Ouya never change course when things are going down the toilet. They try to have this image of an indie, but it's only an image. You can't get a word out of the at Ouya account that isn't joyous celebration of something they're doing or enabling. I suggest you read the whole post, as it's a well-written account of all the flaws with both the Ouya and Ouya, the company behind it, and their marketing campaign. It would kill me if, due to other projects abusing the Free the Games Fund, people lost confidence in our project and what we're trying to do. 
never-ending nightmare creator Matt Gielenbach told Joystick, adding, While I believe in the idea of the Free the Games Fund, I think it definitely could use some reform in light of potential avenues for abuse. I think they should require a certain number of backers for the project rather than just a budget amount. Even Mike Bithell, creator of Thomas Was Alone and the upcoming Candlewick game, criticized Ouya, saying of the Twitter post in which they double down on the fund that, This isn't an acceptance of criticism or an explanation of how clearly dodgy as hell schemes are being supported by you publicly. In PR, at least, I really hope you weasel out before giving the Gridiron Thunder guys a penny. This reads like a press release from a console company locked into a foolish policy and using aspirational language to shift the blame, weirdly, onto critics. Saying it's weird to shift blame to critics is a very outdated thing to say, but anyway, eventually the pressure became too much for Ouya. They did go on to fund the Gridiron Thunder, but pulled support from Dungeon the Eye of Draconis, prompting McDonald to cancel the campaign. Ouya implemented a new rule into the fund that requires 100 backers for every $10,000 raised. As a result of this, Rose and Time was put back on the Ouya store. It's not really relevant, but I kind of figured I should make that clear. But screw you if you have $10,000 from 99 backers, I guess. But the whole concept was so deeply flawed, it's inevitable someone was going to get screwed over. Those screwed over were the potentially legitimate developers who were part of the fund that say they were never fully paid. Among them, Joe Pi. P P P Trooch, I I'm sorry about that, creator of Chain Gang Chase, which raised over $11,000 on Kickstarter, and Left Handed Games, creator of Lobo Destroyo, which raised over $43,000. To this day, neither game has yet to release. The entire Free the Games Fund debacle is owed its own video one day, but I don't think it can be underemphasized just how bad this was for Ouya and Kickstarter, but that's also another video. These are the people Ouya were putting their name on, the people Ouya were defending even after they admitted to gaming the system and threatening backers. This is PR 101 stuff, and they failed miserably at it. And then there were the games themselves, or should I say, there weren't the games, because there weren't any. Not any good ones, anyway. Well, that's super unfair and hyperbolic, but I gotta say things like that on YouTube, otherwise people stop watching. There were some legit great games on the Ouya, like Towerfall, 2004's The Bard Tale, Hidden Plain Sight, the Final Fantasy III remake, Beast Boxing Turbo is a personal favorite of mine, Bob Squad, and a whole bunch more. The problem was, most of these games were available on other platforms, and since the Ouya was running the mobile versions of these games, they were usually inferior to what you could play on PC or console graphically and technically. Believe it or not, the Ouya did have some exclusives. The aforementioned Towerfall is probably the most well-known, created by Matt Thorson, who later went on to make a little game you might have heard of called... Chaos Heart. Oh, and also Celeste. But there was also Soul Fjord by Airtight Games, Killing Floor Calamity by Tripwire Interactive, Reagan Gorbachev by Team 2-Bit, Whispering Willows by Nightlight Interactive, Duck Game by Landon Podbielski, and of course, Gridiron Thunder, among others. But that kind of tells you what was wrong with the Ouya, doesn't it? With the exception of Towerfall, none of those games were really all that special. Who wants to buy a $100 console for some indie games that they never heard of, or are just okay and can be played on PC or mobile later anyway? Because most of those games I just listed were indeed ported to PC consoles and mobile phones, within a year or two. So who did play these games? Nobody, and we can prove this. The most played and most purchased game on the Ouya was Towerfall, which Matt Thorson stated sold a whopping 7,000 copies on the system. 7,000. I'm not a rocket surgeon, but I don't think a console's best-selling game pushing less than 10,000 units is a good thing. After its release until its death, there's not a whole lot to say about the console itself. There weren't any notable releases or updates for it pretty much its whole life. The upgraded model Ehrman talked about in 2014 did finally arrive, sporting a new black shell, double the storage, and a new controller. But it wasn't enough, as developers abandoned the Ouya in droves when they realized that no one was playing the thing. The PR around the company was at an all-time low between the failed Free the Games Fund and taking so long to ship their bankers their rewards. 2014 was quiet for the system. I'm tired of saying the O word. But 2015 was huge. In January that year, Chinese retail site Alibaba invested $10 million into the company, allowing Alibaba to integrate the Ouya software and game library into their own set-top box in China. Also, at some point in early 2015, Ouya received funding from another venture capital group, Triple Point. This was done behind closed doors, and we don't know how much they invested in Ehrman's company. What we do know is that very soon after, Ouya was on the verge of bankruptcy. And when we raise this money, it means that we have arrived, that there is a need for an open game console, 
and that there is support from gamers and developers alike. And you're the signal to the world that this is wanted. Word broke in April that Ouya Inc. was looking for a buyer after they failed to pay off their debts. They were in some real tepid water too. As Ehrman wrote to investors in a leaked email that month, Given our debt holders' timeline, the process will be quick. We are looking for expressions of interest by the end of this month. Yeah, I too am looking for expressions of interest. A couple of weeks later, they found their buyer. In June 2015, Razer purchased Ouya Inc. from Ehrman for an undisclosed sum. Ehrman would leave the company while Razer acquired all of Ouya's software and IPs. Not the hardware though, including the console or the controller. Razer didn't want those. They would rename the store Cortex and launch it on their own micro console, the Razer Forge, and Chinese set-top boxes like Alibaba's t t Tamal, t -mall? and the Mi. They would also open the doors to publishing games through the Ouya in China. And that's why they made this purchase. It was to use the software and games to expand Razer's presence in the People's Republic. And in case you thought we were done talking about the Free the Games Fund, we are most certainly not. As old McDonald said, developers in the system were paid in installments for meeting development milestones. Well, by mid-2015, some of these FTGF games were still in development, and were still relying on payments from Ouya. News leaked that Razer would not continue to fund these games, scaring the bejesus out of these indie developers. I'll spare you the riveting legalese, but basically there was a clause in the original contract Ouya and these indie developers signed that stated if either party was shut down, declared bankruptcy, or reorganized, the deal would be null and void, and their life forfeit. Maybe not that last part. Developers that were part of the program, speaking anonymously to Polygon, claimed that representatives from Razer contacted them, telling not to expect the rest of their funding. Also, gently telling them not to go to the press about this. Estimates put the total amount still owed to various indies at around $620,000, meaning Ouya hadn't even paid out half of their million dollar purse yet. As you can imagine, the backlash proved to be severe, and the very next day, Razer publicly reversed course, saying that they would indeed honor the contract, with one change. Games no longer had to be exclusive to the Ouya store, now the Cortex store, but developers did have to provide Razer with a certain number of free downloads to subscribers of Razer's online service. Razer has a real interest in supporting indie developers and furthering the expansion of Android FTG developers while creating a more open, sustainable distribution model that benefits gamers and expands revenue opportunities for all parties involved. Also, we don't want to have to deal with the bad PR. So how was the new Forge Cortex TV smart box micro console Ouya Extra Mayo hold the pickles? Well, James Sanders from Android Police called it a miserable piece of crap. The Forge TV launched without Netflix, something it still to this day does not support, and the promised ability to stream games from your PC through it never happened either. The Ouya store in its library was supposed to bolster its own gaming content, but as we already discussed, the Ouya didn't have a good enough library to support itself, let alone another micro console set top box. But the game the gaming experience itself seemed to be fine. The gaming experience was solid. I played Asphalt 8 natively on the Forge TV with the gamepad and saw smooth, responsive controls and 1080p graphics on the connected TV, wrote PC Mag reviewer Will Greenwald with his fingers connected to his hands. That was how most of the reviews I saw went. The games ran fine, but there just wasn't enough of a reason to play this over a console or PC. Yet the whole thing was a rousing and a rousing success, and everyone lived happily ever after. Except, you know, that's not true because I started this episode episode by saying how the Ouya is dead. Yeah, that whole Cortex Forge TV thing Razer had going lasted about five minutes. Released in May 2015, just a month before the acquisition, the Razer Forge TV was pulled from store shelves in November 2015. Yep. I found an article from January 2016 talking about a redesigned Forge TV being shown off at CES that year, but I couldn't find anything else about this or a relaunch for it. Despite this, Razer continued to support the online store and the Ouya brand for years to come. Until now. On May 22nd, 2019, Razer announced they were shutting down the Cortex Game Store, which was run on the Forge TV, the Ouya Hardware, and the Mad Cat's Mojo, which we'll save for a future video. They didn't give a reason for the murder, but it's not hard to guess. The Forge TV and Mojo will still be able to access the Google Store and other apps, so it's not a huge deal for them. But for the original Ouya Hardware, it's a death knell. The Ouya only supported the Ouya Store, meaning without it, the box is just that. A box. Razer isn't even sure you'll still be able to play the games you already downloaded. As their website notes, games downloaded that appear and play may still function if they do not require purchase validation upon launch. If you're that one person that spent thousands of dollars on Ouya games, 
Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe try the new one of the Mega Duck next. And so the Ouya comes to an end. Not with a bang or even a whimper, like most of us probably will. Advice with so much promise to empower indie developers, to bring great games at an affordable price to gamers, and to start a brand new trend in gaming with the micro console went up in flames. Then the charred remains were left standing for years to come because nobody cared enough to clean it up. As for Julie Ehrman, she stuck with her nomadic roots. After leaving Ouya, she became head of platform business development at Jaunt, a cinematic virtual reality specialist whatever that's supposed to be. She then went on to become Executive Vice President and General Manager of Lionsgate's myriad of streaming services. She was then hired in 2018 as the Head of Media for Playboy, where she'll be in charge of developing virtual and augmented reality properties. Yes, the creator of the Ouya is now making VR porn. According to her LinkedIn profile, she also serves as an advisor for no less than four different companies. The concept of the micro console isn't advising anything, except maybe its own grave. All of these things went by the wayside because there just isn't a market for them. Which makes it kind of awkward that nobody told Atari and Television who are both releasing brand new micro consoles next year. You can watch my video on them if you want to keep going down that rabbit hole. So long, Ouya. We barely knew ya.